This video does not have a sponsor. However, you should absolutely go over and pledge to Jello's Epithet Erased Kickstarter. Epithet Erased Prison of Plastic is a canonical continuation of the web series where Molly Blind Death takes a well deserved vacation with her friends, both Trixie and Fenica. While on the beach, they encountered the body of Wizard Rick Shades and bring him back to the store to recover. Things, however, take a turn for the worse when Molly's older sister Lorelai gets involved and plunges the party into a totally not a reality marble called a Dream Bubble, where Molly must then rescue her friends from her sister's epithet. Chapter 1 of the audiobook is available for free on Jello's YouTube, and if you're interested in getting the audiobook published in its entirety, you should head on over to the Kickstarter right now and help them reach their new stretch goals. At the time of the recording, they've hit all of the immediate ones, but by the time this video is published, these should be expanded. Did. Head on over to the Kickstarter and show Jello some love. Hey folks, this is part two of our analysis of Epithet Erased. If you have not watched our Giovanni video and you aren't sure what the rules of this particular universe are, go watch that right now. Not only was it a pretty good video, it explains exactly what an Epithet is, as well as some neat behind the scenes trivia and lore you may not be aware of. Anyway, today we are going to be looking at the rest of the characters of Epithet Erased. We will be analyzing their alignment based on the behaviors that we see in the series. However, before we begin, I want to give a few rules on how we will be proceeding. Longtime subscribers of the channel know that I tend to do two types of analysis when it comes to characters or series in the terms of alignment. There are the single character videos, like Sephiroth, Zuko, or Shrek, and then there are the every character videos, like my Undertale, Spider-Verse, or Kung Fu Panda. The single character videos are pretty simple, where I follow a character through a sample of their fictional life, and I determine what their character development is through a brief description and, of course, Pavlovian bell rings. The every character videos tend to either follow the main character closely and then give a few paragraphs on every other side character, or my insane Undertale video where I go through the story a beat at a time and give a paragraph on literally every mook that shows up. Today, stupidly and to my editor's chagrin, I am going to be doing a little bit of both. And that's because of the unique structure of Epithet Erased. As many of you know, Epithet Erased is a web animation series that is based on YouTuber Jello Apocalypse's homebrew tabletop setting called Anime Campaign. Uh, by the way, I did put the rules in the description this time, I promise. Because of this, there is a lot of characters to choose from, and aside from Giovanni, the status of main character is somewhat contentious, varying from episode to episode. Really, season one of Epithet Erased is split into two different arcs, the museum arc and the western arc. The museum arc features Molly Blindef as a point of view character. We follow her and her misadventures with Giovanni as she learns to value and stand up for herself. After episode five, the main character shifts to Percival King, as we follow her through Redwood Run as she is joined by Ramsay Murdoch in an attempt to find the Arsen Amulet. Both of these characters will serve as our point of view perspectives and the relative straight man of their arcs. So these two will serve as our follow characters throughout the video, but I will give paragraphs to everyone else as we progress throughout the series. To begin, let's take a look at Molly. Her epithet is dumb, which is not to say that she is unintelligent. In fact, she is pretty much the only character with more than one brain cell in this series. Her epithet allows her to silence an area or dumb down pain in others. Molly is a 12 year old girl with the worst father in fiction. Years ago, her mother died, presumably in a fire, which gave Molly a massive case of pyrophobia and started her life in a downward spiral. After her untimely death, Molly had to pick up all the responsibilities left by her mother. This unfortunately meant she had to adopt all the habits of a mother while still being just as powerless as being a kid. She now looks after her father and her brother and assumes all duties that they need to do, like run the family business or do all the family's chores. Molly is unfortunately a pushover and a big softie, combining the worst parts of being a good kid, but also being a narc. Hi, I'd like to go to jail. We will start her alignment at Lawful Good, but we're also going to put her on the edge in between good and neutral, just leaning good a little bit, because while she is sweet and very kind, this is mostly because she is a massive pushover and is constantly being told what to do. Speaking of lawful and good, our next protagonist is such a cop, she would assume that a cab would mean all cars are breakable. 
and the phrase was created as a reminder to all automobile drivers to drive safely with their families. Her epithet is Parapet, which means her powers are a tower defense game and she can create fantasy buildings that have an array of side effects like lightning sentry and healing. Percy is all the way lawful good, like to the corner. She is such a good bean, they'd put her in like a salad or something. I don't... <laughs> <laughs> As we progress throughout the series, we'll take a look at more characters and their deeds, but these will be our two focus points. And with that out of the way, let's go. And Molly's fine. Very well. Please. Call me Percy. Hold on to that energy. <laughs> You're going to need it for the night shift. What? Molly's first action in the series is actually in a flashback where we see her being told to take the night shift at her family store, despite the fact that her father should be doing it. She agrees, which is lawful neutral, but then we see her being hit by a sleepy epithet that knocks her out until evening. Also, just as a heads up, Molly's dad is the worst. On Jello's Twitter, he said that he's a carefree and chaotic dad, but like, I just hate this guy. He makes Molly do everything and he's just so selfish and the most unlikable guy in the show. Just saying, there's emotionally unavailable dads and then there's this guy. Chaotic neutral. Hello, this is the cops. Hi, I'd like to go to jail. After she realizes she can't leave the museum, she realizes that she's a criminal and then calls the cops to narc on herself. Lawful neutral. We're the Bonsai Blasters. The baddest of the bad. Pose with me, minions! <laughs> and so, like, the Bonsai Blasters all have some kind of personality, and that personality is dumb. They are all dumb. However, they are all fiercely loyal to Giovanni and follow his orders to the best of their dumb abilities. Flamethrower is easily lawful neutral for being a male cheerleader, I guess. I, I got nothing. Ben is chaotic stupid because Jello is playing him and would insist on it. And Car Crash is chaotic good because he crashes car a lot, but he's still willing to drive others around for free, which is not only thoughtful, but also irresponsible. All right, boys, take aim. These guys really don't do much of anything other than get wrecked by Indus later so I'm just gonna call them all lawful neutral and call it a day. Though supposedly Dark Star has an epithet called binary, like binary stars. That doesn't mean anything, but lawful neutral. Hi, I'd like to report a robbery. Her attempt at self-reporting, however, is interrupted by Giovanni, who captures her and ties her up. Molly is then found by Indus, the bodyguard of Mira, and the tour guide from earlier. She also helps him with her epithet. Lawful good. <laughs> Giovanni then attacks Mira, and Molly dumbs down the attack for her, not realizing Mira was the bad guy yet. Sadly, no good deeds go unpunished, and she is captured by Indus, who then beats up the blasters with their combo attack. Neutral good for Molly. So you need to let us out. Yeah, that's the rules. Molly then teams up with Giovanni to trick Indus into letting them out of their makeshift prison. Molly is upgraded to Minion Boy. She feels bad about it, but then learns that she doesn't need to feel guilty because she's a bad guy now. She tries to turn herself in again by tricking Giovanni, but is held back. They continue to team up to stop Mira and Indus from stealing epithets with the Arsan amulet. Chaotic good. All right! Fort Cool Guy complete. Molly and Giovanni team up to construct Fort Cool Guy, a space for them to establish as a base to fight Mira and Indus. I think it's not really clear why they built Fort Cool Guy. Mm. She has a heart to heart with them before they're attacked by Dr. Ashling. They do their best to fend him off and eventually beat the doctor using their epithets. Ashling then summons his persona, Dr. Beefton, who overwhelms them, but Molly solves the problem by sounding the museum alarm, which wakes Ashling up from his beefy dream. Chaotic good. We need to team up if we want to beat that lady. Fine. The three of them then team up to get the amulet away from Mira and Indus. Lawful good. <laughs> Speaking of which, we should talk a second about Dr. Ashling. Dr. Ashling is a child prodigy who graduated college at the age of 15 to be a psychologist. You'd think his highly technical career would lead him to a very studious attitude, but like, no. Ashling admits that he stayed behind in the museum illegally to study the Arsene Amulet and just kind of does whatever his emotions tell him to do. He doesn't care about the rules or anything and he's just kind of full of himself. Granted, he's just a 15 year old kid, so yeah, that tracks. Also the same alignment for Dr. Beefton, chaotic neutral. Greetings, small girl and others! It is I, Indus Tarbella, the man whose epithet is Barrier! Indus, his epithet is Barrier. Also, he's just like, the sweetest character in the whole series. Despite being the bodyguard of Mira, he's genuinely looking out for everyone he comes across, even his enemies. He's also just a fiercely loyal, big dumb himbo, and everybody loves him and he just has too much heart. Just give him a lawful good and a hug. Not bad, kid. 
that power of yours is actually pretty impressive. I think I'll take it. Mira serves as the main antagonist of the museum arc, and she's got a really, really strong but really unfortunate epithet, fragile. With this, she is practically able to destroy anything, but unfortunately, it also constantly damages her body. Mira uses the arson amulet to take Dr. Ashling's epithet away, and isn't particularly kind about it as she tries to do the same thing to Molly. While sympathetic and a fun villain, she is still neutral evil. Something something, bull in a china shop. That's a pretty bad one-liner, but no one's around to hear it, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> While Mira and Ashling fight, Miley runs away from Indus and manages to stumble her way towards Mira shortly after she took Ashling's epithet. She tries to relate to Mira as she is reveling in her victory and is about to take her epithet, but instead uses herself as a distraction to pull off the silent but deadly technique with Giovanni and save the Arsene amulet. Chaotic good and Nat 20 scene. Boss, give it back to him. Please. After saving the amulet, Molly then convinces Giovanni to give Ashling his epithet back. Neutral good. Oh no! I am an unwilling hostage! I hope I am not hit by a gun or a real ass goddamn sword! After their victory, Officer Percy King bursts onto the scene and brandishes a real ass goddamn sword. Thinking quickly, Molly pretends to be a hostage so that Giovanni and the rest of the blasters can get away. She even covers for Giovanni later when she's interrogated. Chaotic good. All right, let's group up into teams of three and sweep the building. Speaking of Percy, throughout the museum chapter, Molly has been calling the police and trying to alert the authorities that there's a break-in. Eventually, Percival answers the call, especially when the fire alarm goes off. She manages to get on the scene and arrests Indus and Mira, but fails to capture the bonsai blasters. She takes Molly home, but the next day questions her for more info. Lawful good, even though it won't move because it's in the corner and it's maxed out. Ramsey eyes it up and down with his gross rat face. Giovanni contacts Ramsey Murdoch since he's managed to get the Arsan amulet. Ramsey confirms it's worth possible millions, but Giovanni elects not to sell it for himself. Because Giovanni recruits Car Crash to take him to Redwood Run in order to do this, Car Crash does what he does, and so Percy comes to the scene in order to help him, where she discovers that Redwood Run is overrun by bonsai blasters. Oh my god, that is a sentence. She barges into town and immediately gets into combat, to which she fends off. Lawful good for all of that. Hey, Ramsey. How you doing? Ramsey is then threatened by Zora, who is looking for the arson amulet. In his panic, he teams up with Percival, who rightfully thinks working with a criminal is a mistake, but believes he is relatively harmless since he claims he doesn't have an epithet. Cops work with criminals all the time in order to catch more dangerous criminals, but this is pretty free balling, so let's go with chaotic good. Police lady! Police lady! Percy tries to arrest Giovanni and is then caught up in a bar fight with the Bonsai Blasters. She apprehends and questions the one they capture. Lawful good. Hey, hey! That amulet looks pretty good on you, Bugsy! Well, thank you! Oh, right. Uh, Bugsy and Arnold are chaotic evil, leaning neutral evil. They're jerks and they enjoy being jerks and are betraying other jerks. Don't think too hard about it because they're not worth it. Chaotic evil. <laughs> All right. Percy then captures Arnold and convinces him to tell them where Bugsy is heading. Lawful good. Next, I'll lay down a wizard tower. Percival King. Percy and Ramsey then run into Howie, a Mundy with a ridiculous work ethic. He is ridiculously skilled in building and is fiercely loyal to his honeybee workers and is a massive workaholic who expects to die at a young age from overworking. It's as funny as it is depressing because all of that will be the fate of most of us millennials. Lawful neutral. Hey now, that's the spirit! Hiya! The two are then intercepted by Zora, who has been tracking the Arsene Amulet this entire chapter. Zora is one of the leaders of Bliss Ocean, the Mundi terrorist organization who hate those with epithet powers. Her goal is to eliminate all epithets because they take the fun out of everything. She is a thrill seeker and does whatever she can to give herself a challenge, but isn't afraid of being underhanded to win certain fights. She will even just straight up cheat when angry enough. Still, I think the fact that she did stop attacking Ramsey and Percy during their duel after they got their team attack off does show that she values honor above victory. Lawful evil. A man came in to report a case of golden buttocks. Ah, uh, yeah. Operation Midas. Finally, we get to my favorite boy, Ramsey Murdoch, played by friend of the channel, Will Sop. He played Vinti in our Pokemon D&D campaign. Check out his character's tragic backstory in this animation right here. 
Ramsey is the thief with the heart of gold. In his past, he ripped off a lot of super rich bankers and businesses for millions with his epithet Gold Bricker. He also helps other fledgling criminals for free and does deviant art commissions on the side and doesn't judge you, even for the weird stuff. He helps out both Giovanni and Percy and wants to do good. He also just kind of wants an easy life, so chaotic good. I like your spirit, lady. Let's shake on it. However, after Zora appears, she challenges Percy to a duel in which she accepts. She then uses her eraser cuffs on her and Murdoch to make it fair. After a long hard fight and some quick thinking for Murdoch, the two manage to trap her in a combo attack, static clean. Nat 20 scene and lawful good. Ta-da! Here you go. The genuine article. After defeating Zora, the two then celebrate the fact that they got the amulet back. Percy arrests Ramsey for his past crimes, but assure him that she will do everything she can to make his life in prison easy if he agrees to work with the police in future investigations. Neutral good. So our two main characters move to similar places on the wheel, kinda, by the time this is over. Or at the very least, they need huge strides towards the same direction. Molly's arc is more about valuing herself and learning to stand up for herself and not getting pushed around. She also got a bit of spice to her because she does actively help Giovanni escape the law, not once, but twice, which is a pretty big deal for a little kid to do. Granted, her trust is well-placed and Giovanni's a great guy, but you know, like, woof. <laughs> Percival is a cop by the end of the show, but she learned to never underestimate those born without gifts, but also when it's appropriate to apply the full force of the law. Although I argued she wasn't exactly inflexible before and her change isn't quite as drastic as Molly's, but her relationship with Ramsey is just my favorite. It's funny, I mentioned earlier that Percy is the straight man of the pairing, but that's actually kind of wrong. Ramsey is much more of a straight man and it's Percy's adorkably adherence to the law that causes most of the comedy and most of the problems this arc. But. What did you guys think? Can you think of more independent shows that I can cover? Be sure to check out the Giovanni video and I'll see you next time.